Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Mitchell of the Cato Institute. On behalf of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity, thanks for taking time to learn more about a key economic issue. Today, we're going to talk about the Laffer Curve. This is the hotly debated notion that tax cuts, at least in some circumstances, generate additional revenue. And it's named for Art Laffer, an economist who was an advisor to Ronald Reagan. Let's look at this graph of the Laffer Curve. As you can see, we spared no expense to put it together. My son even got a B in his art class for this. It's based on the simple and presumably uncontroversial proposition that government won't collect any revenue if tax rates are zero. This is point A. But neither will government collect any money when tax rates are 100%, which is point C. After all, who's going to work if politicians seize every penny you make? Art then explained that there is a revenue maximizing tax rate, which, just for the heck of it, we'll call point B. Dr. Laffer explained that the top federal tax rate, which was 70% back in the 1970s, was so high that it discouraged the people in that tax bracket from engaging in productive behavior, and it encouraged them to figure out ways of hiding income from the IRS. When tax rates got this high, Art explained, governments could lower the rates and actually collect more revenue since people would have more incentives to both earn additional income and to report that money to the IRS. In other words, the 70% tax rate was so high that we were on the wrong side or the downward sloping side of the Laffer curve, somewhere between points B and C. This meant, of course, that it was possible to lower the tax rate and collect more tax revenue. Let's look at a quick example. Let's say that people in the highest tax bracket are willing to report $100 billion of taxable income when the rate is 70%, but they are willing to report $300 billion when the rate is 28%. Now, you don't need to be a math genius to see that the revenue feedback is so large that the politicians get more tax revenue. Now let's consider some of the implications. Let's stop right here. This point needs to be emphasized so we understand how the Laffer curve operates. As this graph illustrates, if we raise the tax rate from 15% to 20%, tax revenues will rise from point D to point E. Revenues climb because, even though people may not like the higher tax rate, it's still at a reasonable level, so it's not going to cause big changes in behavior or have a big effect on economic performance. But what happens if the tax rate rises from 25% to 30%? Revenues still rise from point F to point G, but the revenue increase is tiny because the tax rate is reaching a level where people do change their behavior, and the decline in taxable income almost offsets the impact of the higher tax rate. This means, by the way, the government is imposing a lot of damage to get very little additional revenue. And when the tax rate jumps from 45% to 50%, revenues actually decline from point H to point I. This is because the incentive to work, save, and invest falls a lot, and the incentive to evade and avoid the tax man rises a lot. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Now let's consider some of the implications of the Laffer Curve, and also dismiss some of the myths. There are three things you should understand. First, notwithstanding the previous example, and notwithstanding the exaggerated claims of some politicians, the Laffer Curve does not mean that all tax cuts pay for themselves. Indeed, it is only in very rare cases that this happens. There's pretty good evidence that tax collections from the rich rose when Reagan cut the top tax rate from 70% to 28%. There's also lots of data showing that reductions in capital gains tax rates have increased tax receipts, largely because taxpayers easily can avoid the levy by holding on to assets when the tax rate is too high, but they are willing to sell assets and pay a tax when the rate is reasonable. But in the vast majority of cases, we're on the left side or upward sloping side of the Laffer curve. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't lower tax rates when we're between points A and point B. The economy will improve and taxable incomes will rise, but the increase in taxable income will not be enough to offset the effect of the lower tax rate. There will be revenue feedback, in other words, but not enough to make a tax cut self-financing. Second, the amount of revenue feedback varies depending on how you cut taxes. Supply-side tax cuts, such as income tax rate reductions, capital gains tax rate reductions, and dividend tax rate reductions, will generate Laffer curve effects because they reduce the tax penalty on productive behavior. And when people respond by working more, saving more, and investing more, the result is more taxable income. The actual level of revenue feedback depends on the situation, of course. Other tax cuts, though, such as expanded credits, deductions, and exemptions, 
are unlikely to have any significant impact on incentives to engage in productive behavior. This is because the marginal tax rates on additional increments of work saving and investment are probably unchanged. This doesn't necessarily mean these are bad tax cuts. It just means that they don't lead to meaningful changes in taxable income, so there is little or no revenue feedback. Third, I definitely want to stress that point B is not where we want to be on the Laffer curve. The revenue maximizing point may be here, but the growth maximizing point will be somewhere on the upward sloping section of the curve. Now, I don't like government spending very much, so I'm tempted to say it's point A. But there are core public goods that help a market economy function. Things like rule of law, public safety, honest courts. And while I'm not fixated on whether revenues and spending balance in any particular year, it's not a bad idea to pay for the legitimate functions of government as those costs occur. Now, it goes without saying, of course, that a simple and fair flat tax is the best way to finance those expenses. So let's reiterate. Government could collect more revenue by climbing the upward portion of the curve and raising the tax rate closer to point B, but it would be very costly in terms of lost economic growth and lower pre-tax incomes for workers. So let's sum up what we've learned. We know there's a Laffer curve. Heck, even John Maynard Keynes wrote that, quote, a reduction of taxation will run a better chance than an increase of balancing the budget, end quote. But we also know that some people on both sides of the debate exaggerate. Yes, there are a few tax cuts that may pay for themselves, but the vast majority of tax cuts are not in that category. And it's also true that there are some tax cuts that generate zero revenue feedback, but those also are rare cases. This concludes part one of our series on the Laffer Curve. I invite you to watch part two, which reviews the evidence showing that the right kinds of tax cuts mean substantial revenue feedback, and also part three, which explains why the revenue estimating system used in Washington needs to be modernized. As always, please share this video with your friends and colleagues. On behalf of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity, I'm Dan Mitchell. Thanks for watching. Welcome to part two of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity series on the Laffer Curve. I'm Dan Mitchell with the Cato Institute. Part one of this series outlined the theory behind the Laffer Curve, explaining that the tax rate has an impact on the level of taxable income and that changes in the tax rate cause a revenue feedback effect. We also explain that there is a tax rate that maximizes government revenues, but if the tax rates rise above that level, tax receipts actually fall because the economy slows down and taxable income shrinks. Now it's time to look at some of the evidence. In part one, we created an example to show how the government could collect more money with a 28% tax rate than with a 70% tax rate. But some of you may have thought that our assumption that taxable income would jump from $100 billion to $300 billion was unrealistic. A rigged example, so to speak. It's always good to be suspicious when somebody is from Washington, so let's look at the real numbers. Everyone's favorite bureaucracy, the IRS, publishes something called the Statistics of Income. If we look at their numbers for 1980 and focus on the tax returns showing taxable income above $200,000, we find nearly 117,000 rich people. These folks, the ones hit by the 70% marginal tax rate, reported more than $36 billion of taxable income that year, and the IRS grabbed more than $19 billion of that amount. So what happened in 1988 when the top tax rate had dropped to 28%? The IRS numbers are astounding. The number of rich people jumped to nearly 724,000, and they reported nearly $353 billion of taxable income above $200,000 a year. The government's slice of that pie was more than $99 billion, five times as much revenue as was collected when the tax rate was 70%. You heard me right. The rich paid five times as much tax when the tax rate was slashed. Now, before jumping to any conclusion, let's throw in a few caveats. Not all of that additional revenue is because of a Laffer curve effect. Population grew by about 7% during that period. We also had total inflation of about 44% during those eight years. And perhaps most important, even if Reagan hadn't reduced the tax rate, there would have been some increase in the number of rich people and the amount of income they reported. So to be fair, Reagan's reduction in the top tax rate was not responsible for the rich paying five times as much. It may not have even been responsible for the rich paying three times as much. But can anyone doubt that there was a huge amount of revenue feedback and that this was one of those rare cases of a tax cut paying for itself? Heck, this was the Laffer curve on steroids. Let's look at a couple of other examples. 
Ireland used to have a 50% corporate tax rate. That corporate tax rate in 1985 collected tax revenues equal to 1.1% of GDP. By 2004, as the chart shows, the tax rate was all the way down to 12.5% and revenues were 3.6% of GDP. And what's really amazing is that GDP was more than three times bigger, and that's after adjusting for inflation. So Ireland's government is getting a much bigger slice of a much bigger pie, even though the tax rate is much lower. Actually, what the Laffer Curve teaches us is that the government is getting a bigger slice because the tax rate is lower. Here's another example. Russia used to have a so-called progressive tax system with a top tax rate of 30%. That wasn't too surprising. After all, Karl Marx was one of the first advocates of penalizing successful people with higher tax rates. But in a dramatic reform, Russia implemented a 13% flat tax in 2001. Did this result in less revenue? Definitely not. Receipts from personal income tax rates have skyrocketed, jumping from 175 billion rubles in 2000 to more than 930 billion rubles in 2006. The chart shows that inflation-adjusted personal income tax revenues have been growing by an average of nearly 19% annually. Now, once again, let's stop. Don't get too excited. It's time for some caveats. To help illustrate how the Laffer curve works, I've picked some extreme examples. These are a few of those rare cases where tax rate reductions result in more revenue, what might be called a strong Laffer curve effect. But as we discussed in part one, the vast majority of tax cuts don't give the government more money. Instead, the revenue feedback is more modest, meaning that the growth in taxable income is not enough to compensate for the effect of the lower tax rate. We'll call this more common occurrence a weak Laffer curve effect. And in a few cases, of course, where tax cuts aren't designed to improve incentives to earn taxable income, there's no revenue feedback at all. And even though I hate talking about higher taxes, it's also worth mentioning that the Laffer curve works in reverse. If politicians increase tax rates, especially if they do something really destructive like boosting the top tax rate and punishing entrepreneurs and investors, people will earn and report less taxable income. One of the most classic and tragic examples of the Laffer curve had nothing to do with income tax rates, though. In 1990, as part of President Bush's surrender of his Read My Lips, No New Taxes promise, he agreed to a so-called luxury tax on yacht purchases. This punitive tax supposedly was going to make rich people pay more tax. But guess what happened? Those rich people bought fewer boats, or at least they bought fewer boats in the U.S., so the IRS collected less money than projected. But that's just the beginning of the story. Lots of boat yards lost business, so they generated less income for the government to tax, and a lot of middle-class workers in those boat yards lost their jobs, meaning not only that they had less income to tax, but also that some of them started relying on government handouts. So it was a lose-lose situation for the budget. Now, disentangling all these different effects is not easy, but it's quite likely that the luxury tax was a net revenue loser for government, a reverse case of the strong Laffer curve effect. On that cheerful note, let's bring this to a close. The final video in this series will get you angry. We're going to discuss in part three the revenue estimating process for tax legislation. You will think I'm exaggerating, but you will learn that revenue estimators assume that tax policy changes, regardless of their magnitude, have no impact on the economy and no meaningful impact on taxable income. Even more disturbing, you will learn how this bizarre approach creates a bias for bad tax policy and higher tax rates. So if you want to get angry, watch part three. I'm Dan Mitchell, and I thank you for giving us some time. As always, please help the Center for Freedom and Prosperity Educate America by circulating these videos. Hello again, I'm Dan Mitchell with the Cato Institute. Time for the final segment in the Center for Freedom and Prosperity's video series on the Laffer Curve. We've already talked about theory in part one and evidence in part two. So we know that good changes in tax policy lead to more taxable income, which means that tax rate reductions generate revenue feedback. Conversely, we also know that tax rate increases will hurt economic performance, and since this translates into less taxable income, it means tax hikes at the very least do not raise as much money as politicians want. This is common sense for people in the real world. Business owners know they would lose customers if they doubled their prices, so they would never assume that this is a realistic way to double revenue. Likewise, entrepreneurs always look for efficiencies because they understand that they can increase total profits if they can lower prices and attract more buyers. Unfortunately, common sense is a rare commodity in Washington, 
And the revenue estimating system is a perfect example. When Congress debates tax legislation, it relies on the Joint Committee on Taxation to prepare official revenue estimates. This committee, which is controlled by politicians from the tax writing committees, assumes that changes in tax policy have zero impact on the economy's overall performance. I'm not making this up. The JCT even admits on its website that, quote, the Joint Committee staff assumes that a proposal will not change total income and therefore holds gross national product fixed, end quote. Let's look at a couple of examples to understand what this really means. If Congress is debating a bill to double income tax rates, the Joint Committee on Taxation will assume that the economy's growth rate is unaffected, even though such a proposal would have a crippling impact on incentives to work, save, and invest. The Joint Committee on Taxation would even assume there is no macroeconomic impact if the Internal Revenue Code is put in the shredder and replaced by a simple and fair flat tax. It doesn't matter that growth has expanded and that more jobs have been created in the countries that have adopted a flat tax. The JCT ignores real-world evidence and instead relies on simplistic models. This system is known as static scoring, and for decades, experts have urged the JCT to modernize their methodology so that lawmakers have more realistic information when considering tax legislation. The recommended new approach, known as dynamic scoring, would estimate Laffer curve effects so that revenue projections are more accurate. Now, defenders of the status quo claim the JCT does dynamic scoring, but this is only true in the very limited sense that the models incorporate what are called microeconomic effects, such as people using more tax preferences to protect their income when tax rates increase. But this is like guessing who won a baseball game by looking at the score in the first inning. Yes, it's part of the answer, but only a tiny fraction of the information needed. Here's a real-world example. Back in 1989, I worked for Senator Bob Packwood of Oregon. As the ranking Republican on the Finance Committee, he sent a letter to the JCT asking how much tax revenue would be raised if the government confiscated every penny above $200,000. What did the JCT say? Well, on your screen, you can see Senator Packwood's November 14th floor statement in the congressional record. As the senator explained, the JCT estimated that this 100% tax rate would collect $104 billion in 1989 rising to $299 billion in 1993. And when Senator Packwood asked the bureaucrats whether this was realistic, they gave him the same revenue estimate, but included a footnote stating that, quote, these estimated taxes do not account for any behavioral response, end quote. This is sort of like the fiscal equivalent of, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the play? So why does this crazy system exist? There are two explanations. The charitable explanation is dynamic scoring is difficult. If you ask five economists to estimate how much faster the economy will grow under a flat tax, you'll probably get six different answers. So how then is the Joint Committee on Taxation supposed to measure revenue feedback? Another complication is that short-run answers are probably different than long-run answers. The 2003 tax rate reductions are a good example. The attached chart shows the JCT's estimate of revenues compared to what actually happened. In the first couple of years, the JCT was pretty close. They even overestimated the amount of revenues in 2004. But in more recent years, actual revenues have been considerably higher than the JCT estimate, presumably because lower tax rates on dividends and capital gains have improved economic growth, something the JCT makes no effort to measure. Another challenge is disentangling the effects of multiple policies. If politicians raise taxes and adopt protectionist policies at the same time, the economy will be hit pretty hard and it would be difficult to figure out which bad policy deserves which share of the blame. These are some of the reasons why dynamic scoring will never produce a 100% correct revenue estimate. But the key thing to understand is that it will produce an estimate that is much closer to the truth than static scoring. Let's now shift to the less benign reason why dynamic scoring isn't being used. Simply stated, some people like the fact that the current system is rigged against good tax policy. Congressional budget rules are designed to make it difficult, at least on paper, to approve legislation that increases the budget deficit. And since the JCT routinely overestimates the revenues that can be obtained by raising tax rates, and likewise exaggerates the revenues foregone when tax rates are lowered, static scoring tilts the playing field in favor of bigger government. And this is why the tax and spend crowd is dogmatically opposed to dynamic scoring. Let's close with an interesting observation. The Joint Committee on Taxation refuses to make its revenue estimating model public. Instead, the JCT operates in a totally non-transparent fashion, even though we taxpayers pay their salaries and finance their so-called model. 
maybe it's time that we get to peek behind the curtain and see what we're getting for our money. I suspect we won't like the answer. And I bet the defenders of the status quo are against transparency because there's no way to defend static scoring in the cold light of day. I'm Dan Mitchell. On behalf of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity, thanks for watching this series on the Laffer Curve. Please share these videos to help spread the word.